Hi, everyone. My name is Matt Moses. I'm Gideon Evans. And uh, this podcast is called Interesting Times. That's right. Gideon and I, um, we worked at The Daily Show together many, many years ago. And then before that, we also actually are connected via our high school. We, we were both from Brooklyn, grew up there. And uh, we went to the same high school, though, at different times. And Gideon really helped me get my first job in TV, actually. Really? Did I? Uh, I know, don't know about that. Well, mm, I think at least a little bit. Like, I think maybe we spoke before I got the job. Oh, because right. I think Rory, one of our, our uh, teachers, who was a theater teacher, uh, he, I think, connected us somehow. That's nice. Yeah. Yeah. Well, you know. I'm happy to help a tiny bit. Well, thank you. Re- retroactively. You made it all possible. And, and we have been in the world of comedy. We did improv at the UCB. Yes, we both. We're both, uh, go both ahead. writers. You're a, you know, a, a great writer. Uh, went to Yale, got your MFA there. Yeah, I got wow. my MFA in playwriting there. So I am a theater guy as well. Uh, and Yeah. Oh, we both have kids too, so we might true talk about true. that just a little bit. And and uh, we should talk about the title a little bit. Interesting times. I was kind of saying I remembered this great like Yiddish saying, mm, right? Uh, from the old days, uh, maybe my parents had mentioned it. It's like may you live in interesting times, and it's kind of like putting a curse on somebody because it's like sarcastic, right? Because it sounds times. sort of good, like oh, interesting. Who doesn't like interesting? Right, but I think the I the idea of the curse was that like interesting is bad because it means there's shit going on. Right, because so it's, it's interesting to the future. That's what we're going to read about. We're going to read about the sort of worst times. That's what we're most exactly. Yeah. But then you sent me the Wikipedia article that, or it's not a Yiddish phrase at all. No, all, it was attributed to a a Chinese curse, and it was called the Chinese curse. Although it. Not at all. Has nothing to do. So the Wikipedia page kind of says that it was maybe like Chamberlain, right? It was. It was actually. It was actually his dad, Chamberlain? Neville Chamberlain's oh, oh, dad, who was also oh, a politician, jo- Joseph or something. Yes, that's right. Uh, he said it, I guess, in a letter, and I guess they think that's where it was first happened. Uh, and I, uh, I'm not sure the Chinese part was connected to it then, but then I think it actually really got popular. In the '60s, when Robert, in a Robert Kennedy speech that he made in South Africa, uh, where he said there is a Chinese curse which says, "May he live in interesting times," and uh, you know went on to say that uh, that's both good and bad, basically, and that we are more open to the creative energy of men than any other time in history. Hmm. So he he tried to put a positive spin on it. I th- I guess the '60s were interesting. Oh yeah, probably. yeah, and and I guess these times do kind of feel slightly the the turmoil of today's times feels a little like the '60s, so maybe there is a similarity there. Yeah, I wonder. Or you know, we're in um, in Germany before um, the war. I, right. I mean, I don't think we're in that bad Why shape, but I? maybe I don't know Argentina or something. Yeah. Well, hopefully not, but, uh, uh hopefully not, got... but it does feel, it does. Feel, I, I always wonder with this is are we, do we just always feel that, oh my gosh, everything's falling apart and there's a lot of stuff on the horizon that's super concerning, uh, or is it just now, uh, is it, is it specifically now feels uh, more intense? I think there's a degree to which people feel like the world's falling apart all the time, but it definitely just feels more so now. And everybody on the news always brings up that whole thing with, like, Obama wearing the tan suit. Right. Remember that? Yeah. Oh, yeah. Uh, It was like that was a big deal. And it's like that would be, like, the the 200th, like, thing. (laughs) You know, that was, I mean, it wouldn't be a thing at all, and it shouldn't have been a thing, but the only reason why it was a thing was because there wasn't that much other shit going on. Right. There was, yeah, it just, uh, yeah, they had to make something out of nothing. Yeah, everything uh, was a Genie Moose piece from... (laughs) Oh my God, Genie Moose. Yeah. Wow. She Making making the most of it. Well, yeah, we we used to talk about her a lot at... uh, 
Daily Show, I think we would because Jeannie yeah. Moose has these sort of fluff uh, CNN pieces, and she still does it. Uh, you know, and they can be quite a bit of fun, but usually they're sort of silly, like this dog wears a bow tie. He's excited. Kind of. As for the dam building, that's instinctual behavior for baby beavers, even without parental instruction. But Nibby is hopping mad at ZB, and this is one baby beaver who really gives a damn. Genie Mouse, CNN. We would say, though, if someone would pitch an idea for a piece, Giddy and I both worked in the uh, field department. So I think if somebody at, pitched at a Daily piece Show. at the Daily Show, sorry, yeah. yeah, and if somebody pitched a piece, uh, it, you know, it would be a negative thing to say, like, eh, it kind of sounds like a Genie Moose piece, you know? right? Yeah, you couldn't consider Genie Moose like comedy, really. Although she she would consider herself comedy, right? It was, but she it, was it was too goofy and too light and too fluffy and too, right. and like there were plays on words and stuff, right? No meat on the bone. Exactly. So, uh, so we have a clip, right? Yes. Let me get the clip. Let me cue this up. We'll play this. So this is a clip from 60 Minutes. It's on the this past Sunday's 60 Minutes. Scott That's correct. Kelly. Yes. Scott. There's a town in South Carolina, Beaufort, South Carolina. Uh, it focuses in on them. And it's, these Moms for Liberty are all about book banning. And uh, right now we're hearing a gentleman speak about uh, some of the tactics these moms used. And um, one of them is uh, going into the library and accusing the librarian of giving their children pornography. We've had a parent come in and tell a librarian that you are violating a state statute by providing pornography to a minor. I'm going to the sheriff. I'm going to have you arrested and storm out. Now that's not ha just happened once. That's happened multiple times at multiple schools. I even got an email saying, okay, the sheriff has said no. The solicitor said no. I'm going to the FBI. So this guy, just to clarify, this guy works in the schools uh, um, for the schools or... I believe that's the case. Yeah. Yeah. So, and he's Republican. I'm pretty sure. Yeah, he's and a Republican. He, yeah. And even he, and this is South Carolina, but even the Republicans are like, they just don't know what the hell is going on. Because, I mean, again, to kind of clarify about this group, the the group basically asked the schools if they had these books in their library. So it's not even like the books were assigned to anybody. That's right. The thing that they're against is that the books happen to be in there, just sitting there. Right. And that's what this guy, the, the thing was, there was a policy in place where uh, parents could just go tell the librarian that you don't want your kids to read a certain book. And the librarian said that she never had a parent do that ever and then i think there was even an option where you could fill out a form that says don't let my kid check out any books without my approval also no one did I, yeah no one did that um and they made these complaints and they could tell uh that no one uh had actually read these books they didn't know what was in them there was actually just this website they went to that would tell people which books they wanted to get banned um, that, and that was a national uh, website, and that's how these Moms for Liberty uh, tackled the issue from uh, a local level. And I think, I mean, I'm pretty sure I'm right about this. I think what has kind of exacerbated the situation is that the po the local politicians, like governors and these, you know, state Congress, state senators, or whatever, they have created laws that say. Anybody can complain about anything. It's not just people who go to the schools or parents or teachers or people in the local community. Like, if I live in Texas, I can call Florida and make a complaint about the Florida libraries. Wow. So it just, like, created the system of, like, all these vigilantes, like, trying, like, the crazy crazies out there huh. just want, were on this, like 
were hell-bent to, like, just ban these books that they read about that they didn't even read, obviously. I didn't Nobody know. Had. I didn't know that. I wonder if people uh, who were against this would just call them up and ask if they had the Bible in their library since, you know, there's a lot of racy stuff. Absolutely right. I mean, yeah. that's the big gotcha. That's the big, that's the big gotcha. There's a lot of violence in the Bible. I mean, there's too. a violence, there's sex, there's rape, there's incest. There's slavery, probably. Slavery. Because they don't want to have uh, any stuff about race. There's all this talk about, like, uh, there probably is talk about race in the Bible, maybe. Right. I don't get how uh, they're against the race thing. It's not dealt with in this piece. But that's one of the things they mention is that uh, they wanted to go after books that were... Uh, you know, about L LGBTQ people um, or had any sort of uh, sex in it. The race thing was was kind of like, well, well DeSantis was, he ha he made all those laws in Florida about, you know, critical race theory. Right. One was about... actually just uh, overturned because, and it was the one that said you can't um, sort of discuss race in your private workplace. And say how it's a sensitive issue and sort of educate people on how not to offend other people basically and how to be nice and right. uh the court said like you can't regulate speech within a private company it's the most ridiculous thing and the weird thing is i mean a lot of these laws that desantis came up with were uh based on the curriculum or the right. curriculi, whatever the the proper term is. Mm. And that was like what the teachers actively teach the kids. But these moms for liberty, they're they're all about just do you have this book sitting in your library? So that's like however you feel about like this type of content and kids getting to it, I mean, obviously I don't think either of us have a problem with any of it, but uh I doubt it. No, I really doubt it. Too, well, I think I... the only issue is maybe there was one time where a book that was for teenagers that dealt with sex was in a library for younger kids. So right. I understand like, hey, let's not put that in the library for younger kids. But that's like, come on. Nobody was trying. It was a mistake. And and even if it was in the library, if it's just sitting there. Right. I mean, you know what? That's an excellent point as well. I mean, I kind of think uh, you remember the old cartoons um, back in our youth, like the Tom and Jerry and stuff, or Woody Woodpecker, when there's like a roast turkey, and there's like <laughs> yeah. the flavor or the smell of it kind of comes off, and it becomes a hand. Yeah. Oh. You know what I mean? Oh, and yeah, it, yeah, yeah. It's kind of tempting, like a cat. Right. By like right. saying, "Come here to the turkey and eat the turkey." Yeah. Yeah. Like I kind of feel like. That's the way they see these books, and they're so concerned about like people getting groomed that like even if a book is just sitting there in a library not doing anything, that there's some sort of like evil like spirit. Right? Do they really that, think like, oh, this book might make my child gay? Is that true, or that might make I them mean, trans or something, or black? They of, might, yeah. It's kind of what I'm saying. Like maybe that's just me saying it, but it does seem like the their focus. And, and that's kind of what they say in the 60 Minutes piece, that the complaint is, are these books sitting in your library? It's not even like, is somebody teaching these? It's right. And there, like, there was, they complain, they always go to the word groomer, uh, at which Scott Pelley, who did the piece on 60 Minutes, challenged them on and said, well, what do you mean about this groomer? And they avoided it. They, they, they kept dodging the question, I, I guess, because right. it's, it's, it gets very hard for them to back up because it makes... Children no have had the best teachers. I've had the greatest teachers that have influenced and impact me. But there are rogue teachers in America's classrooms right now. Rogue teachers. Rogue teachers. Parents Correct. send their children to school to be educated, not indoctrinated into ideology. What ideology are they being indoctrinated into? Let's just say children in America cannot read. They often dodged questions with talking points. You're being evasive. 21% of Hispanic students are reading You're on being grade evasive. level. What ideology are the children being indoctrinated into? What is your fear? I think parents' fears are, are realized. They're, they're looking at these books where sexual discussions are happening with their children at younger and younger ages. Answer. I guess right. because the ideology is probably like, uh, 
gay ideology or something or right. you know sex ideology and they it's... do think basically it's gonna turn their kid like gay or trans that's ultimately has that's to be their worst nightmare yeah the well parent, you know not this the, sp- not the kid right kids kids do want that i mean that's an aspiration of theirs but mm-hmm. it just can't work out for every kid right right uh so, uh, you know, there's actually been a situation right here in my uh, town where I live. I live in California. Uh, and uh, there's a guy who was sort of outside the community, came and moved here, and he got really involved in agitating the school board. And at the time, I think he had very young kids. He might have a kid in the school system next year or something, but he was you know, with all this groomer stuff, uh, this guy named Jordan Henry, and he was a candidate, uh, for the Glendale, uh, unified school board. I live in Glendale and, um, he actually organized this rally in front of the school district's office, which was across from my kid's school. And, uh, they, it was really a gross thing, and there was uh, fights broke out, and it was but all on was video. What was he uh, I think they were protesting the curriculum, um, saying, and I, I think you know maybe some of the curriculum mentioned that gay people exist or something. Yeah, uh, but I'm I'm not sure in what context exactly, but. Uh, uh, but anyway, there was this big rally. Fights broke out. And then I was walking to my uh, daughter to school the next day. And uh, I looked and I saw a Proud Boys sticker on a pole. And it's like, oh, this is what you're doing? You're bringing the Proud Boys to our community? And you think you're uh, helping anyone? How disgusting. Uh, so to, to wrap this up a little bit... Uh, he was up for school board in yesterday's election and I was looking at my ballot and I didn't see it anywhere. Anyway, I had to make a phone call and they, I figured out he's not actually in my specific district. So I couldn't vote. I just checked online. He lost. And that's good. Yeah, it it is. Well, I, I mean, before we did this recording, I did a little bit of digging around about the uh, moms for Liberty. Yeah. And they are, kind of it sounds like they're directly tied to the proud boys like it sounds like really? they're in, they're kind of in cahoots with one another that the moms for Li- liberty is a more like i just think like women aren't going to be that into republicans or the proud boys because of right. you know they're kind of anti women so so they so i think the republicans strategically were just like we need something like moms for liberty that would make people like Republicans more. That makes it seem like we care about children. That's a, yeah, that's a smart strategic move. Gross, but smart. And there's a lot, and, and people, they try, apparently they tried to make it seem like a grassroots thing that just came, came from out of the blue, hmm. but it's like a real deliberate effort. The creation of moms for Liberty. It's not just like a few, like random people that like stood up together it's yeah you know yeah yeah i mean it's it's an organized top-down effort yeah uh, to indoctrinate our children (laughs) but you know indoctrinating who this is the thing i i feel about the whole thing it grosses me out because they complain oh you're sexualizing children and to me i'm like you're the one sexualizing children right there's uh you know it's like oh this guy in the library is like oh look i found porn in this kid's in the kid's library and you're like um were you the one who put it there why are you thinking about kids and sex so much why are you making this it's it's gross and i personally wouldn't trust those people those people sorry but those people (laughs) with my kids more so than anyone who's uh, just a normal person who doesn't well, have these issues. These sorts of things happen over and over. The people who claim to be the pure ones, you know, it's so who true. claim to be for family values. I mean, well, one of the things too that I came across, and they mention in the piece that yeah. like one of the founders of Moms for Liberty, um, 
she was like had some threesome that came out about right like, this guy who was the head of the republican party in florida and it was a big scandal but it's like we're never surprised at these stories anymore about the right well i think it's even like, claiming it's like, to be yeah sorry but i i think uh it came out of i think her husband was accused of rape and that's right, how the exactly. story of this threesome came out you know salacious but uh but yeah i mean right right, so. right. it was it didn't just come out as like one sexual escapade he was in big trouble and then she was tied into it yeah Gross. or she was married to him maybe i think she was married to him yeah yeah, yeah. um but i was yeah. kind of thinking about like our you know our our kind of high school and oh like, yeah i mean did that happen I, i'm trying to remember if anybody ever like there was ever any controversy like that about books that were banned from our high school i just don't think in brooklyn they banned books i don't think so although i have heard that it's there are stirrings of it in certain school districts uh you know i'm from a much more uh conservative part of brooklyn deep down uh but we went to high school in Midwood uh, called Edward R. Murrow High School. And so it was a very liberal school and known for being that because uh, it, was, it was sort of set up that you get to choose all these different classes that were sort of uh, a lot of them a little more college like not not the, uh, you know, necessarily the level per se, but just the specificity of going deep on a specific uh, thing. And there were a ton of them. So, and it was a, a lot like it, it, it treated the kids like they weren't idiots and it kind of gave them independence a little bit. Right. Independence was huge because we had this thing called Optus, right? Where you right, could just hang out right. in the uh, in the hallways. I mean, you were supposed to be able to do basically go work or, you know, study or get involved. But a lot of it was just us hanging out and chatting with our friends. Like sneaking out to the bagel store. Oh, yeah, man. We had a really great bagel store right by that school. Yeah, what was your and bagel they, they, order? Well, well, the bagel store would also, they would always make announcements on the loudspeaker, do not go to the bagel store <laughs> during your free, free periods. And then you'd go and the assistant principal would be there and they'd just be like, hey there, hey Gideon, how you doing? <laughs> um, they didn't really enforce it. But anyway, no. they, tr they treated the kids like they were like real people. And like the book banning is kind of, to me, it's kind of like condescending to kids. It's like, yeah, especially you know, older. You kids. can't handle this. Yeah, right. Well, uh, but you were saying, but but so yeah, so you don't remember anything at Murrow like that. Uh, I mean, the only thing I, could, geez, I guess this might be unrelated, but we also had this TV studio at at Murrow, uh, and a friend of mine was in a play, so they would have him on as a guest on like a late night talk show style show and, and this was at at the high school tv studio right? this was at the high school tv studio and i guess during it he went backstage and peed a little bit in a cup and then brought the cup <laughs> on stage and uh it was a, a big scandal and he got suspended and this was like the type of kid who would never get suspended uh so I, and that's that wasn't the only part thing. of the that wasn't part of the play or anything. No, it was just him being dumb. Uh, right, yeah, that's right. all it was. But I guess that's understandable. I mean, you don't want live pee just floating around on stage. But it yeah. was. I mean, it was just old oh, being bad in the cup. So that's all I can think about. But I, I, that that seems reasonable. I guess that's not uh, censorship, though. Really. No, no. And I know that, like, I remember, because so, it was a communication school, so, right. uh, and we were, it was named after Edward R. Murrow, after all. I was always proud that I went to a high school that was named after a chain smoker. It was the, oh, that was yeah. Kind of, that was I, kind of, uh, you know, progressive. I never thought about that. Yeah. yeah. And, you know, we had this thing called the courtyard, uh, basically an outdoor area where all the kids could just go smoke cigarettes. They closed the town in more recent years. Oh, but I always that. thought that was pretty wild that they would just be like, yeah, go smoke cigarettes. And, all you know, people would smoke drugs as well. But that, that they would get in trouble for. And there were a lot of plays that the plays were like really famous at the school. And we both did theater. 
We did. Were, I remember there were some community complaints about some of the plays. Oh, really? Uh, well, well, I did cabaret, and I remember like certain people in the neighborhood were like they shouldn't have like pe- kids playing Nazis wearing swastikas and that sort of thing. And that yeah. was, that huh. was a thing. I mean, the Nazis are bad guys in that, though, right? I know. Yeah. I know. Well, the, maybe the Moms for Liberty would be into that. Yeah, I know. They would like it. I mean, the Proud Boys, I think, are Nazis, right? Or at least white supremacists, which are kind of the same thing, I guess. Yeah. Well, I kind of feel like tying it to Nazism, I do. I mean, it's maybe not fair completely, but I do feel like when, when societies go bad, the first thing they do is ban books. And then the second thing they do is like round up the professors and the artists. Yeah. So this and is why they of... might come they might come for us, the media. Oh yeah, and the media too, for sure. Well that this guy Orban, who uh Trump is hanging out with the Hungarian uh uh-huh, yeah. The head of Hungary. Uh like that's kind of what he did. He like cr- they cracked down on the arts. Did they actually and, arrest and people? Books. I think like professors got in trouble there and it's weird because it still feels sort of like a democracy there, but right. it's like authoritarian light, you right. know, and that's everybody who's scared of Trump becoming president for a second term is like, that's what we're going to become like Orban. It's going to well, be like, it'll feel like a democracy, but it's like your freedoms are going to be cracked down on. Well, that's know? the thing. This is how it, it happens. I read, um, this book uh how democracy was it called how democracies die and then there was another one about the tyranny of uh minority of of the tyranny of the minority and uh basically uh, the way uh, um, most democracies uh end and turn into authoritarian states is in the last since world war ii basically is not through these coups uh like overt coups it's more of a silent coup and uh, it, it basically, it's just slow chipping away at things. And oftentimes, it's doing things that are technically legal, but they're violating norms. And then things happen. And then there's something called, um, uh, ba- basic, I forget the name, but basically using uh, the courts to uh, consolidate your power. And then after that, they just start, you know, outright breaking the law and saying, I'm going to stay in office forever. Uh, right. So I mean, I, I read the book and I, I was like, "Uh oh, it that's it does feel a little scary." I think he could win too. I think Trump could really win. Yeah, for sure. I mean, it's a possibility. It's going to be close, and it always will come down to a few of these states, like Michigan and Wisconsin and Pennsylvania. Yep. But yeah. we'll see. I mean. That's partly why we were interested in doing the show. So we'll, we'll and we'll try to keep it light and funny too. We were like a little serious today, but I think that's okay. Yeah, yeah. I guess we just have had or have a lot of stuff on our minds. Anxiety. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, yeah. And uh, anything else about Moms for Liberty? Well, it's very Orwellian. Because they had the Ministry of Peace, I remember, in 1984. So it is like these... I think they had some immigration thing under Trump that was also very Orwellian, where they have a title for the organization. That's It's the opposite of what it actually does. Uh, it's really... Yeah, I mean, you know, the plans that they're putting out about uh, mass deportations is pretty horrifying. Could be bad. Yeah. Yeah, for sure. Well, we had a light show. A lot of light, a lot of laughs. laughs. Next week will be funnier. Yeah, we'll figure that out. Uh, no, oof. This, this was a good conversation and, you know, one that is, you know, I'm sure we'll come back to. Um, yeah, yeah. I mean, I think this relates to uh, a lot of different issues that are going on. The control, sure. The control of speech is just such a... Uh, a thing well the control of these freedoms that we've taken for granted it's so weird too just to like continue this for two seconds yeah i mean some of these things that are happening i feel like we're already kind of litigated in the past like i feel like wasn't book banning like something that happened in the 70s like it's like 
I remember like Fahrenheit 451 came out and and everyone was like, oh, they banned books in the South. And it was like, ha, ha, ha. And then that ended. And huh. you feel like, okay, you move on from those days. And you look back and you're like, I can't believe people were banning books. But it's like, it's so strange that like we don't progress in a straight line. We yeah. just take two steps backwards sometimes. Yeah. And it's like, shit, man, they're fucking banning books again. And same thing with IVF. Yeah. And oh, when, yeah. When when Ivy and I, I, this is a whole other show, but it's like when the Alabama said, you know, these these cells are people, and then IVF clinics started shutting down. I was like, didn't when they when they when they kind of invented IVF, uh, didn't they already have the controversy of like, should we be doing this? And then they ended that. They were like, yeah, we should be doing it. And then we moved on, and then you'd think we'd move on, but we're kind of like, we're always in danger of, like, falling back into the past of these stupid retro. Yeah, you know. I, there might just be something about human nature that we need to find something to be scared of, because maybe if we verbalize a fear that makes us feel safer. I mean, even us right now, we're, we're verbalizing fears. I mean, I think that they're much more based in reality, but then I'm me. But I mean, I th- objective reality yeah. exists, at least I think so. No, for sure. And I also think speaking out and just talking about it and feeling like these people who are putting these laws uh, into action about like that, that end up banning IVF, maybe they just feel like nobody's paying attention. So even it's just right. good, and it, good it, to pay attention. It is. And, you know, it, it just stirs up their base. Uh but I remember growing up too, and there was always different uh, fears that they would put on the evening news, which doesn't really even exist as much. But it would be great as a tease. It'd be uh, like, God, uh, like children getting kidnapped was a big one. Was a big one. White vans was always. Did, did right. they do the white van thing when you were in? Yeah, for sure. You were always scared of the unmarked van and people like who are going to sell ice, who are like going to lure your child with like, right. candy. Right, and then oh, was... and Halloween, Halloween candy. Yeah, that's what I was thinking. Remember of. that? That yep. was the big one. And now there have been all these articles where it's like nobody ever poisoned Halloween candy. It was basically all bullshit. It was all urban legends. Yeah, it's uh, it makes no sense uh, to do that. I mean, who knows? One person who's extremely insane, and I feel like they'd be uh, caught very quickly. Uh, but then there was also stuff like, oh, they're. Uh, uh, kids are wearing uh, bracelets that uh, reveal what sexual things they've done oh, or stuff right. like that. I remember that. And I don't think that was real in any but was larger that a sense. was fear or was that just like an interesting? Uh, I mean, thing. I think it was uh, to, to work parents up. I, I, you know, I think that's right. still a thing of like oh, sex and I teenagers. Mean, I mean, maybe that's what's happen- happening with the Moms for Liberty, and it's kind of like the internet and social media is, like, exacerbating all of this. Like, we had the Halloween candy scare right. thing in our youth, but imagine how terrible that would have been if we had Facebook and Twitter and it's, all that. Yep, yeah, because, yeah, everybody's working each other up. You know, in the old days, it would just be like, while you're waiting for your kids to get out of school... Right. And that's it. And then it's like, okay, go home, have dinner. <laughs> right. Exactly. Um, all right. Well, I think this is a good show. I think, you know, we're, we're, we're learning so much and, uh, I think we hit on some interesting things. What do you yes. Think? Yeah. I think so. Cool. Uh, yeah. Let's, uh, so next week, uh, I'll bring the clip. That's great. I'll be curious. I'm curious already. Maybe I'll go for something that's uh, less weighty, maybe. I don't know. That'd be cool. We'll see. We'll see what happens in the world, too. That'll determine a lot. Oof. Now I'm I'm scared. (laughs) Now that you said (laughs) that. I'm sorry. No, it's okay. I'll be all right. All right, Matt. Well, this has been great, and we'll uh, we'll see you next week. All right. See you then, Gideon. Bye-bye, everyone. Bye.